turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 2, as we continue with our series looking at um, how Peter is encouraging the Christians who are about to experience persecution about their status before God. If you think about living the Christian life, and uh, if you've been in the Christian life for a while, uh, it is no walk in the park. If you're a true believer and you want to please the Lord, all kinds of difficulties are going to come our way. And in order for us to walk with the Lord, we need to understand our status and we need to understand what that walk looks like. So I want to draw you your attention, 1 Peter chapter 2, and I'm going to read from verse 5, and then, then we will um, look at this morning, and I'll come continue summarize what I did last week and we will continue looking at what the Lord is teaching us. First Peter chapter 2 verse 5 um, let's go to verse 4 talking about worship the section is about worship he mention the temple it was a place that God gave to Israel to worship there on a regular basis in the new covenant, it has changed. We don't need no longer go to the temple, but we, as those of the living stone, come to the living stone. Christ is the temple. Christ and his and uh, the those who believe in Christ are the temple, and coming to Him as a living stone. That is the foundation of the temple. But now it's not just one of mortar. It's a living one. It's seated at the right hand of God. Coming to Christ, which has been rejected by men, but is the choice and precious in the sight of God. That is the approval at the baptism of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, listen to my son. And so we are to worship him. Verse 5, you also as living stones, we've been made alive with Christ, a close association with who he is. We are not just um, believers, we are united to Christ. Look at the connection there. You also as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house for, for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. You can go look at last week and the week before to find out what spiritual sacrifices is. God has, for us as worshippers, we are to be actively involved in worship Him in a biblical way. Look at verse 6, for this is contained in Scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious corner stone, and he who believes in Him will, never, will not be disappointed. Here is a quote that Peter uses from Isaiah, and uh, in the original, in the Greek, or rather in the Hebrew, in the Hebrew Bible, it says, and, and he who believes in it, speaking about this choice stone, will not be disappointed. Here, Peter uses the Greek translation of the Old Testament, and look at the last phrase there, he says, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed, meaning that the temple in itself was a testimony of what is coming in the future, a prophecy that Christ is going to be the point of assembly. This precious, this precious value then is for you who believe, but for those who disbelieve the stone which the builders rejected, this became the very cornerstone. We can only approach God through the Lord Jesus Christ, who is also rejected by many. The Jews rejected him, many still today. You might be sitting here, you've rejected Christ. And what God is saying to you, you can only come to me through the living stone, who is Christ. For many, verse 8, this stone is a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. We do not want to come and submit to Christ. And then it says why people stumble, for they stumble because they are disobedient to the word. And to, the, and to this doom they were also appointed. All of scripture directs us to Christ. Christ is the center point. And if we reject Christ, we reject the only offer 
that God makes for salvation because there's only one name given through whom we will be saved. Now come to verse 9 again. So just to summarize verse 5, from there we are given this foundation of worship. We are worshipers. We are to worship. We come to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Here from verse 9 we have a kingdom, kingdom theme. That not only are we worshippers of God, but we are kingdom people. And let us consider what he says. But you, as a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, you are these things, these are status. This is the status of the believer. In this you must stand firm. In this you must be convinced. That even though you are Gentiles, you are chosen by God. Speaking about election. You are a royal priesthood. You are part of a kingdom. You are to be priest. How does that look like? In our midst, we're going to look at that now. You are a holy nation. Speaking to Gentiles. You're a people for God's own possession. He bought you. He purchased you. And then there's a so that. Very important. You can circle that. So Peter is taking us a bit beyond this. He doesn't just want you to know your status. He also wants you to know your responsibility. In light of this, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Peter does what Paul does in Ephesians chapter 2. He reminds them where they came from. You were once darkness. If you're still living like darkness, then you've never come into the light. So he is saying that you are to proclaim. The word proclaim there is only used here in the New Testament. It means to placard. We have it next to the highway. You drive and you see, oh, there's a new billboard. What is the billboard saying? So it's saying something that you should give attention to. It's so, it say, I want you to go billboard Jesus. What do we billboard about Jesus? I want you to billboard the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We, d- we do this by living and we do this by preaching. For you were once not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Gentiles previously, you were not part of the commonwealth of God, uh, similar to what uh, Paul does in Ephesians chapter 2. But now you are. You have become God's people. And then we will continue. Uh, He says, verse 11, I urge you, Now that you're proclaiming, I also urge you as aliens to abstain. Here's a negative one from fleshly lust, which weighs uh, wars against your soul. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles. Isn't it interesting? He's writing to Gentiles, but he's saying to the Gentiles, keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles. Those who are outside of the kingdom, clearly indicating and communicating that you are God's people now. So that, another so that... There's a purpose for that in the things in which they slander you as evildoers. They may become for you. Uh, They may, because of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. Which means, as trouble is going to approach, and it is definitely coming, I want you to behave in such a way that it will be quite clear that you belong to God. I want to draw your attention by way of review, just two things. The the whole aspect, if you look there in verse 9, chosen race and royal priesthood. We looked at that last week. If you are going to stand firm in suffering, affliction and persecution, there's something that you have to totally and utterly be convinced of. And that is, and here's one, you must know that you are part of a chosen race. 
Christianity here is not I'm an individual that has been saved in the 21st century. There's a lot of individualism. We, we worship Jesus for my benefit. But here we see it is a community of believers. We are a chosen generation. A chosen generation can only come about by one choosing for that pe person to become part of the chosen race. Which means that our belonging and our status is given by God. He has elected us from before the foundations of the earth. Not that we will choose him in history somewhere, but that we will be born in history as he has already known in the beginning that we will belong to him. I also pointed out to you that it's very important for us to understand that basically in this world there are only two, two races. When we look at humanity, no matter your color, we are, there's only one race. I grew up here in South Africa. I'll go to the beach and there was a cow, a bench, that says only for whites, only the belief was that there are many races. That's a lie out of the pit of hell. Uh, Acts chapter 20 makes it very clear that God has made all of humanity from two people. And so we completely reject that and don't read that understanding into this. A chosen race has been, is a race that is chosen out of them who, according to verse 10, were previously, and 11, were previously in darkness. So they are those who are unsaved. That's the natural race of uh, the human race. And then if you are born again, if you belong to Christ, you are part of that race by choice. And whose choice is it? It is God's choice. The reason it is God's choice because of the sinfulness of man and the deadness of him spiritually, he cannot choose God. It needs to be God that chooses him, makes him alive, regenerates him, give him spiritual life to, for him to worship God. Now, of course, this is something that has been a, a huge issue since the third century between Pelagius and um, Augustine. Uh, do we, are we half dead or are we completely dead? Well, the Bible says we are spiritually dead. Romans chapter 3, no one seeks after God. No one can do anything appeasing to God. So God is the one that, that saves. And God alone can bring us out of slavery of sin, as he did with bringing Israelites out of the slavery in Egypt. And he can bring us out of darkness into the kingdom of his son. So the picture that Peter uses here is the picture of Israel in the Old Testament. And we find this right through the book. That just as God saved his people out of Egypt, out of slavery, so God is choosing his people now out of slavery to sin. Slavery to, to the kingdom of darkness. He saves us out of the clutches of our enemy. Now, we looked at this, that this doctrine of election, which often sadly becomes a doctrine of uh, arguments and of division. People will say, well, don't you think it's unfair that God would choose some and uh, not choose others. Well, the point is, if all of us are condemned because of our sin to live eternally separated, separated from God because we are sinners, don't you rather think it's an act of grace that God would even consider saving those who have sinned against him, not only inherited from their sin from Adam, but have also added to it. So how should this doctrine of election encourage us in the face of trouble? And when we face trouble, we can know that God has chosen us. It was His choice. We might be rejected by people, 
But God has placed His attention, His love and affection on me, and that's a great comfort. Secondly, we learn that this doctrine of election can encourage us in the midst of our affliction, realizing that it is by divine grace, which means that God has given something to me that I did not deserve. I've never lived a life, I've never lived a sinless life to deserve God's favor in Him give, granting me forgiveness and acceptance and adoption. I've never done that. And if you think you have, you are deceived. Because Genesis chapter 6 verse 5 says that every thought and intent of man's heart is continually evil. He describes that's God's evaluation. You might have your evaluation, but that's what God says. There is nothing good that dwells in us. Isn't election a comforting thought? Then if we believe, it means that, uh, it's a, that uh, the, this promise of election has been fulfilled in us, that we believe in the only Son of God as our Savior and Lord. Another aspect of election that encourages us in the midst of difficulties and trouble is this, that election is the most holiness-promoting doctrine because God has set His love on us who are unholy. Don't you want to please Him who has brought you to life? Another one encourages us, the doctrine of election encourages us in the midst of trouble, realizing that there is something, it's life is not just about this life. He has not just elected us to be healthy, wealthy, and prosperous in this life, which of course we know is not true. Come to Jesus and all your problems will be solved is a false concept. It's rather come to Jesus and die, knowing this, that what is waiting is eternal and unchangeable. Beyond this life waits for us all eternity. Now, if you don't believe in election and you believe that you can kind of pull it off, it is going to be measured according to your obedience. Who's going to make it if that's the case? No, we are elected into eternal kingdom based on the perfect work of the Lord Jesus Christ and His righteousness. The last benefit of election is that it brings incredible joy. It brings incredible joy because you realize the privilege of being taken out of a helpless situation and being given life and now to live the benefits of our High King. Having said that, we moved on to the second point, the royal priesthood. And here, Peter used Exodus 19, verse 6, where God speaks about his people through Moses, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Here, Peter combines those two concepts. He says, you are a royal priesthood, appointed to have dominion in Christ's kingdom. Who is he speaking to? He's speaking to Gentiles. This royal priesthood, uh, which God attributed to his people, was given to them. But we see in Amos 11, we see that Israel failed. And God says, I will give it to people from the West. You have failed. You have rejected. You, you have, and of course, we know the Jews rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. Another aspect of this royal priesthood is connected to a very interesting figure that we find in Genesis, Melchizedek. After the order of Melchizedek, he was a priest and a king. And in Romans we read that Jesus was uh, his priest and king after the order of Melchizedek. Jesus is not priest according to the order of the Levites that were set apart, set apart by God to be the priest at the temple. Jesus didn't come from that line. He came from the line of Judah. But how is Jesus priest? How did he become? It was 
after a specific order that God communicates to us that it was the order of Melchizedek, who was a priest and a king at the same time of a place called Salim. And you can hear it's the last few phrases of the word Jerusalem. And that is where he was. And we see Abraham gave him a tithe. Abraham had uh, honored him. Uh, Abraham, it will make it very clear in Genesis chapter 14, verse 18 to 20, that Abraham revered him and recognized him as having authority. He was a king. He was also from a different kind of priesthood. Jesus is that kingly priest. Jesus is our king, that we know. He rules all things. Colossians 1 verse 6, 16 says that he is the image of the invisible God. Everything was made through him and for him. He holds all things together. Don't you think that sounds kingly? But he's also a priest making a perfect intercession. So what we find here is interesting that Melchizedek foreshadowed Christ. A perfect royal priest that will come in the future. He offered himself in the new covenant as a sacrifice. He, he went a bit further than Melchizedek. He was not just a priest serving. He himself became the sacrifice. And because of Christ, here Peter is saying to the believers, he calls them a royal priest. He's speaking to Gentiles. How are we royal priests? What are we to, supposed to do? Well, we are to serve the king. We are also to be kings, not in the word of faith charismatic sense, where we go out and take authority, bring down strongholds, bind demons and all those weird stuff. That's not what it means. Nor does it mean that we have been given the power that Jesus gave to the 70 when he sent them out. No, that were given for a specific time, nor do we have the apostles' signs, and this is not what Jesus is saying. No, we are a royal priest separated for God, and we are to rule. How are we to rule? Christians are to be royal priests. Fathers, you are to rule in your houses as royal priests, taking your children to introduce them to Christ. Mothers, you want to do the same. But I love what Paul says to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1 to 4. Listen to this. Does any of you have a case against your neighbor, speaking about a believer? Uh, do you dare to go to the law before the unrighteous and not before the saints? Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? If the world is judged by you, are you not com competent to form the, uh, the smallest law courts? Do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more matters of this life? So if you have law courts dealing with matters of this life, do you appoint them as judges who are of no account in the church? We are to rule and judge according to the word of God. You heard earlier this morning, Enrico was referring to a congregation member who has forsaken the assembly. Are we going to get someone else outside to rule? No, we have the scriptures. We have, it is clearly outlined for us what we are to do. We are to live according to the scriptures. What are the scriptures? All scriptures are God-breathed and profitable for teaching, to teach us the will of God, to reprove us, to correct us, to train us, so that we may be adequately equipped to do what? To be these royal priests. Do you see also another element here is the connection with Christ. Again, the doctrine of being in Christ. We are in Him, the perfect royal priest. We are part of who He is. And let me just add this. This royal priest are often used by certain denominations to, to refer to the deliverance ministry. 
casting out demons and taking authority over strongholds and Satan and rebuking him and pushing. That is not what it's saying. Go read the warning in Jude. It's very clear what it says. Warn against that kind of understanding. As royal priests, we can rule over our own appetites. We can rule over that which God has placed us over. Remember that just as Adam and Eve were given dominion to rule and reign over the earth as uh, vice regions under God. So we are given the authority to go into this world and make disciples of everyone, teaching them to observe everything that Christ has instructed us. So let us not have a wrong understanding of power that people claim that are given to us that we simply do not have the power belongs to Christ, which brings us now to a holy nation. Obviously, thinking about that, that Israel was part of a kingdom, a ethnos, a specific ethnicity in the old covenant, there God was working through the Jews, and they were to be a people, a holy nation for Him for the nations around Israel to see that they have been set aside. They were worshipping in a very unique way. They were set aside as God's people. In Leviticus 19 verse 2, God says to Moses, Speak to all the congregations of the Son of Israel and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord, your God, am holy. Again, in Leviticus 20, 26, So you are to be holy to me, for I am holy. Deuteronomy 7, verse 6, For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. Isaiah 62, verse 12, They, are, they, they will call them the holy people, the redeemed of the Lord, and you will be called, sought out a city, not abandoned. But because Israel sinned, and because of their unbelief, they forfeited the privilege of being a holy nation. The only holy part of the holy nation was the remnant, those who believed in Christ. The rest became secular. They failed. In Isaiah 11 verse 1, I already mentioned this this morning, eight centuries before Christ becoming flesh, he warns them, he says, I'm going to take you out into exile. And the ten tribes of the northern kingdom was taken into exile, never to be seen again. They were never, they were never retrieved. And please don't believe in Israel vision as the lost tribes being found. Or the Afrikaner being part of that. That's not biblical. There's no biblical evidence of that. Nor the, some black folk believe that too. Am I right, Caravo? Uh, there's no scriptural evidence for that. Let's not speculate. Hosea 11 verse 1 says that if Israel keeps on rejecting God, that God will for himself and by himself bring a people from the West, which means which are not part of Israel. And that is something that God would do. Now, if you turn to Matthew chapter 2, verse 13 to 15, and obviously there are some things that need to be explained here. These are theological concepts that was used for Israel. And we need to understand and make this clear for us that there's a specific way in which people, Peter is thinking and communicating to the Gentile people. In Matthew chapter 2, 13 to 15, tells us that Jesus fulfilled this. Now, when they had gone before, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is going to search for the child to destroy him. So Joseph got up and took the child and his mother while it was still night and left for Egypt. He remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what has been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Out of Egypt I will call my son. And when Jesus came out of Egypt, it was a fulfillment. He is the perfect Israel. Israel that was brought in the Old Testament failed. They were taken into exile. They died in the wilderness. 
Even this two and a half tribes were taken to Babylon and then returned. And for the whole time they were living under oppression until Christ came. But here, Matthew is written to a Jewish audience. And the author, Matthew, is saying to the Jews, If you want to see the true Israel, here he is. Out of Egypt I called my son. Jesus is the perfect obedient Israel. He comes out of Egypt... And then in chapter 3, if you turn over to chapter 3, verses 13, or actually, yeah, verses 13 onwards to 14, then it says, Then Jesus arrived from Galilee at the Jordan, coming to John to be baptized by him. But John tried to prevent him, saying, I have tried to baptize you by you, and you do come to me. But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it at this time, for in this way it's fitting for us to fulfill the righteousness then permitted him and after being baptized, Jesus came immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and uh, um, uh, lighting on him. And behold, a voice out of the heavens said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I well pleased. Here you have the Trinity saying, Jesus is the approved one. Now look at verse 1 of chapter 4. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And of course, we see the connections that Jesus wasn't only tempted according to the pattern that we find in Genesis chapter 3 in the garden, but also that Jesus, in comparison with Israel, was tempted in the wilderness just as they were, but they failed. Did Jesus fail? No, Jesus succeeded. And here, Peter uses all of this information to make this statement you are a holy Israel. You are a nation. Why? Why? And here is the point. Those who are in Christ share the privileges and the relationship he enjoys as God's true son. We are not the sons of God by nature, by ethnicity. We are the sons of God by adoption. You're elected, and God has chosen you as Gentiles. You are now a holy nation. You are in Christ. You are the new Israel. Not because we obeyed, but Christ obeyed, and his obedience is given to us as righteousness. Here you hear substitutionally living and sacrifice coming through the whole time. And how essential it is for us to know the gospel. Jews and Gentiles and whoever trusts in Christ is the chosen nation, is the new Israel. This has been fulfilled for us in Scripture. This should be an encouragement. We sing a hymn about God take us through this barren land. And we are in a barren land, but we are his people. We are not orphans. We are not second grade people of God. We are his and when suffering and difficulty come, we need to remind ourselves of this. It is by God's choice that we have become the holy people of God. The only way for Israel to enjoy this privilege, the current Israel, the secular state that we see, those who are outside of Christ, because people do ask, what about the Jews? If they repent of their sin and believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ, the only Lamb of God, they too will share in the privileges of being the chosen race. Are you part of a holy nation? Have you trusted upon the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord? Are you trying to live your life so that you will be accepted? You'll never be able to do it. You need to believe in Him 
the true Israel, who was completely obedient, whomever believes in him will have eternal life, whomever believes in him will receive his perfect obedience, whomever believes in him will receive forgiveness. 1 Corinthians 6.11 says, Such were some of you, meaning outside of Christ, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of our God. Listen to, P, to Paul write to the Corinthians, who were an interesting bunch of sinning saints. 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, this person is a new creation. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. Do you live in the reality that you have not contributed anything to your salvation, but receiving Christ by faith has given you all the privileges and benefit? That is the gospel, and that's the only gospel. There's no other gospel beyond that. Christ is at the center. 2 Timothy 2.21, Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from these things, he will be an implement of honor, sanctified, useful to the Master, prepare for every good work. How are we sanctified? We come to him who washes sinners. You can't be saved through keeping the law. You'll never be able to keep the law. The purpose of the law is to show you you can't keep it and for you to seek another Savior. And there's only one who perfectly kept the law, the one who came brought out of Egypt, who was tempted in the wilderness, didn't sin in any part, is believing in him. Jesus Christ is at the center. At the Jerusalem counter, uh, uh, um, Jerusalem Council in Acts chapter 15 verse 7, some of our questions regarding Israel is answered. At the council, this statement is made. Because there was lots of confusion between Israel, the people of God of the Old Testament, and the new Israel. And you know what was said? Verse 9 of chapter 15. And he made no distinction between us and them, speaking about the Gentiles, cleansing their hearts by faith. We are saved by faith in the Redeemer, by the Lord Jesus Christ. Have you been saved through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you trying to, to work up your way to God? Well, let me tell you something. You can't do it. You need to become his possession by purchase. Look at the next phrase. He's saying that you are a people for God's own possession, empowered to possess the kingdom. You, uh, you are empowered here, Peter uses Exodus 19, verse 5. Now, then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession. How do you become the possession? It's interesting here in Exodus 19, verse 5. It seems as if God is saying, if you keep my law, if you keep everything, then you will be saved. But what God was doing is he was trying, he was telling them, you cannot do it. You cannot obey by your own laws that you've made up or the law of the Bible. You can't obey yourself into heaven. But you must look to him who has obeyed and put all your trust in him who obeyed and then look at what he did. He who obeyed fully, fully purchased for himself a people for his own possession through his blood. You and I can't do those rituals. And so are you a possession of God? The ultimate price for your purchase has been paid. And so again, it comes. Our trust is in the blood of the perfect sinless lamb. He's a purchaser of sinners. In order for you to benefit from this, you have to be a sinner. And you have to say, it is, I can do nothing to become part or his possession. He must do everything for me. Purchase me. Have you been purchased? Have you been bought? Are you his? Because that, if you want to glorify God most, then rely on the Lord Jesus Christ 
That's what's going to bring him the most glory. Let's continue. Look what he says further. He goes on and he's, he's reminding them now. Remember who these Gentiles were. They were pagan worshippers there. It's modern day Turkey where these people lived. They didn't, uh, they didn't know about God and the creation order and all those things. He says, you are a chosen people. You, had, um, you have uh, um, a people for God's own possession. And then, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness. There's one thing that is very true about a believer. They know their history. And sometimes we want to try and hide our histories. Friends, we all have a history here. It is only the proud that is going to hide it. We have histories. Some of us are very colorful histories. This is what God does through his son. Look what it says. You need to proclaim, this is a testimony, the excellencies of him who is God alone, who has called you, now the chosen people of God, previously you weren't the chosen people of God, out of darkness into his marvelous light. Paul uses the same thing, and he actually explains in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 2, he says, and you were dead in your, in your offenses and sins, transgressions and sins. We are all born spiritually dead. There's not one of us here that came into this world spiritually alive. And listen how he explained what our state were. In Ephesians 2, verse 1 to 2, in which you previously walked according to the course of the world, not according to Christ, worldly standards, world system, according to the prince of the power of the air, that's Satan himself, his kingdom, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience, that was the spirit you obeyed. If you're not a Christian here this morning, you are under that false kingdom. And then he goes on, and he explains further there in Ephesians of what the behavior looked like, the moral darkness. Look at verse 3. Among them we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, sexually immoral. You don't think God's thoughts. You just think about yourself. and Indul Indulging in the desires of the flesh, addictions, slavery to whatever. And of the mind, you were darkened in your mind and were by nature children of wrath. God is angry at you, even as the rest. That's the natural man's state. 1 John 5, 19 says, We know that we are of God and that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Now let me explain this to you. There are three kind of spiritual, there are three kind of darknesses that God needs to deliver us of. The first one is spiritual darkness, a state we are born into. The Bible says we are conceived in sins, Psalm 51. The psalm, the, the psalm has continued and says we go astray from birth. Our default, and as beautiful as that baby is, that you are expecting in your belly, or the one that was born, man, on day two or three, you see Eve is right there, programmed for evil. We are trapped in that. God needs to deliver us from that. The second trap that we are in is intellectual darkness, ignorance. The natural man is unable to see the truth of God. That's why I love Acts chapter 16, talking about Lydia, that says the Lord opened her eyes, opened her heart to believe what Paul said. What was he doing? He was reversing intellectual blindness and darkness. The third darkness that we are born with is moral darkness. Not only the, in, the inability to see God, but the inability to do what is acceptable to him. There are some of you sitting here, you have a temptation that does not take no for an answer. 
When you think it, you've got to do it. You know what that is? Moral darkness. You need to come to Christ for him to set you free of that. You cannot do it. Cold showers are not going to do it. Running a mile every five minutes is not going to do it. Becoming religious is not going to do it. You need to come to Christ. Listen to Psalm 58 verse 3. The wicked have turned away from the womb. These who speak lies go astray from birth. Jeremiah 17 verse 9. The heart is more deceitful than all else. Romans 8 verse 7 to 8. Because the mind is set in the flesh is hostile towards God. 1 Corinthians 2 14. But the natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God. Christ has to remove that. He has to reverse the darkness. This is what they are saying. This is what Peter is saying to these believers. He says, you need to go placard Christ because he's the one who reverses evil. He's the one who will birth you, will get you out of darkness, will bring you into the light. He's the one that will take you who choose to live in darkness to come and develop an appetite to live in light. Christians are called out of darkness. You cannot continue to live in darkness. If you live in darkness, you need to be brought to the light. And where do you need to look to be brought to the light? You need to be brought from him who was resurrected out of the grave where the sin was, where your sin is, to lead you out into life. Call upon the name of the Lord and he will save you. Colossians 1 verse 13 says, For he, he, speaking about Christ, rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved Son. Are you a believer? Have you experienced a transfer? Have you received your heavenly green card? It's through rebirth. And there's maybe some of you here who do not want that because you love the pleasures of this world. You've been offered this morning to call upon Christ, to be reminded again of those things. Listen to these frightening words as a warning. Paul is speaking about the Jews who do not believe but he's also speaking about every single person that refused to call on the Lord. He says this, In whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving, so that they will not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. That's a sad statement. Today when you hear the voice, today when you hear the calling of Christ, Call on Christ. It starts with a simple, have mercy on me, Lord. Save me from myself. Look at the next point. I'm going to finish this. There was a time when we did not have mercy, and we were the recipients of mercy. God has held away and he promised to hold away from you that which you deserve. You call upon Christ. Judgment will not come upon you. Why will it not come upon you? Because the punishment due to the believer has already been given to Christ. God does not punish the same sin twice. Will you call upon Christ, the merciful one? And then, just lastly, by way of application, this is what we need to proclaim. This is what we need to placard. It's about the gospel. Church is about the gospel. Your life is about the gospel. You are to publish. You are to advertise. You are to billboard the Lord Jesus Christ. We as a church... 
there could be a big billboard out here. Come to Christ, all who are burdened and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You are without a defense if you face hardship and affliction and persecution is heading your way. If you are in Christ, all of this is yours to rely upon. Spiritual truths that we can preach and proclaim. If you are without Christ, I plead with you. Seek him. He will make sure you find him. Call on his name. But for those of you who hardened your heart and continue to love sin, know this. Day of judgment is coming where we will stand before God and we will give an account. And there will be no... <coughs> There will be no release. The believer relies upon the judgment has fallen upon Christ. The punishment was handed out. The unbeliever does not have that. He has to receive the punishment for his iniquity. Let us face our troubles as God's chosen people. His possession. Be confident of our status in Christ. We are his and nothing can separate us from him. Let's pray. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the new obedient Israel, in whom we are grafted into. We are in Christ. Whatever happens to him will happen to us. He was exalted, we will be exalted. He was raised, we will be raised. He is in heaven, we will be in heaven. I pray for everyone here struggling with sin, loving the pleasures of this world, to consider their ways and call out to a merciful, loving, gracious Lord Jesus Christ who waits for sinners. Will you be the one working in our hearts, repentance and faith? We pray this in Jesus' name. There will be no hymn this morning.